What is up, you guys? Welcome to another edition of Controversial Thoughts. I get a lot of questions at Heart and Soil about gout because what we do is we make desiccated organ supplements. And as you all know, one of the things that I believe in most strongly is the importance of eating nose to tail and getting organs in our diet like our ancestors always, always have. Uh, I was recently listening to a podcast that David Cho did on Joe Rogan and really want to go live with the Hadza. And he got to spend months with them. Other people I know have spent months with the Hadza. I've read multiple research articles about the Hadza, but I'm fascinated by this culture in Tanzania. So on this podcast, David Cho said that he asked members of the Hadza tribe what the best day of their life was. And invariably they responded that the best day of their life was when they killed the biggest animal and shared the entirety of it with the tribe. Both David Cho mentions this, my friends, my other physicians that I know who have been with the Hadza and articles will show the Hadza and indigenous hunter gatherers eat nose to tail. There are unique nutrients in these organs, which is why we make desiccated organs at hardened soil to make it easier to get these unique foods in our diets. We've got blood builder, histamine and immune came out last week, beef organs, bone marrow and liver, fire starter, gut and digestion, hardensoil.co if you guys need this. But the question that I get is, what about these organs? Will they cause gout? Will they worsen my gout? And don't organs have purines? Doesn't meat have purines in it? I've been told by my doctor to avoid these foods because I have gout. This is a super interesting question. In some ways, I think it's the sharp end of the spear. And so I wanted to dig into this. So I'm gonna explain what gout is, why I don't think that gout is caused by organ meats per se, and why it's all about context. I'm gonna do another video later this week about context. Uh, and I've got a podcast coming out tomorrow with Dave Feldman where we talk about context with regard to LDL, but context, our underlying metabolic health determines everything when it comes to gout, when it comes to ApoE4, when it comes to the atherogenicity or the participation in the formation of an atheroma of an LDL molecule, as you will hear with Dave Feldman. So what is gout? Gout is essentially the precipitation of uric acid crystals in joints, the big toe, the digits of our hands, the elbow, things like this. We get gouty tophi, tophaceous gout. Uric acid is a molecule that is derived from the uh, formation, derived from purines in our diet. So I'll screen share this. You guys can see if you deaminate adenine and guanine, you make hypoxanthine and xanthine. And these are then acted upon by xanthine oxidase to make uric acid. So here is that formation, hypoxanthine and xanthine. Again, these come from uh, adenine and guanine respectively. Uh, xanthine oxidase forms xanthine from hypoxanthine and uh, uric acid from xanthine. Allopurinol is of course a mainstream medication that inhibits the formation of uric acid by inhibiting xanthine oxidase. Whether or not this is a good thing is questionable, but nevertheless, this is the way we treat this in Western medicine because in many people, overproduction of uric acid appears to fuel the fire. Now, we must also remember that many people are also insulin resistant. This is the main problem I have with the way that Western medicine thinks about everything, whether it's LDL, uric acid, ApoE4, et cetera, is that we must not conflate the idea. We must not conflate ideas here. We must not be confused. We must not assume that because that in a setting in which many people in the population have underlying metabolic dysfunction, up to 88%, according to some assays, as I've shown in previous videos, that doesn't mean that the condition always holds that more uric acid equals gout or that more LDL equals more atherosclerosis because there remain a growing portion of the population, many of you, myself, who have more organ meats and meat in their diet and don't have elevated uric acid or who have elevated levels of LDL and don't show any evidence of the progression of atherosclerosis, et cetera. There are many tribes uh, throughout the world, the Bolivian Simene, the Semain, uh, however you pronounce it, the Nigerian Yoruba, I've talked about these in the past, who demonstrate lower rates of cognitive decline, lower rates of dementia when they are ApoE4 or ApoE44. So these things don't always hold true. It's about context. And that is what Western medicine misses. But just because something looks like it has a strong association, we must remember that the majority of people have metabolic dysfunction. They are metabolically unwell. How do we become metabolically healthy? You guys can listen to all my other videos if you have questions about that. I believe it has to do with adipocyte hypertrophy, 
primarily driven by excess polyunsaturated fatty acids. This is what I've been talking about incessantly the last few weeks. Peter from Hyperlipid came on the podcast. He'll be out next week. I talk about it a little bit with Dave Feldman in the podcast that is coming out tomorrow. If you guys are curious what my uric acid is, I will show you. So this is blood work I obtained a few weeks ago. This is from August, 2020. My uric acid is 3.9. I'll do a separate video on TMAO. I talked about that with my buddy, Kurt, when we reviewed his labs. But my uric acid is below the reference range. And believe me, you guys, I eat more meat and organs than 99.9% .9 of the planet. In fact, I eat a lot of freaking organs. I have a lot of purines in my diet. Why isn't my uric acid going high? Why don't I have gout? Well, a lot of reasons, but the first point that I wanna make here is that just because you eat meat and organs doesn't mean your uric acid is going to go up. The second point that I'll make in this video is that just because your uric acid rises doesn't mean you'll get gout necessarily. We see this in the setting of ketosis, which I'm gonna talk about in one moment. If you refer back to the previous controversial thoughts video I did with my buddy, Kurt, we looked at his labs, his uric acid was essentially the same as mine. We eat very similar diets, this was 3.8, Eating meat and organs does not mean that your uric acid will rise necessarily. There's something else going on here. So to give an overarching perspective here, generally it is accepted that uric acid accumulation in people with gout, again, people who most likely have underlying metabolic dysfunction, is not an overproduction, it's an under excretion. It's the fact that they are not getting rid of as much uric acid as they should be. When we treat people with gout in mainstream Western medicine, we use two different types of drugs. We use allopurinol, uh, medications that block xanthine oxidase, and we use medications like probenicid, which increase the excretion of uric acid. But we'll talk a little bit about why uric acid might be going up in some people at the level of the kidney. Regardless, I think it's very important to point out that just because a human is eating meat and organs in large amounts does not mean that their uric acid is going to go up. Furthermore, there's a lot of evidence that uric acid rises in the state of fasting. Why is this? Well, a lot of people seem to speculate. We don't know for sure, but a lot of people believe this is because ketones interfere with the excretion of uric acid. So just thinking about this intuitively, a normal phenomenon that would have happened for humans throughout our evolution, starvation, fasting, unsuccessful hunts, is leading us to accumulate a molecule that's going to lead to gout, which is gonna make it much more difficult to track an animal or hunt them down hunt, makes absolutely no sense. We're missing context here yet again. So ketones do appear to compete with uric acid at the level of the kidney, increasing uric acid temporarily, but in the studies that have been done here, there's no increased incidence of gout with fasting, and I'll show you that right now. So this is actually a pretty darn interesting study, short-term intermittent fasting for weight loss, a case report. This is one healthy but slightly overweight male underwent complete fasting for two full days, resumed with normal eating for five days. They looked at fasting, it temporarily raised uric acid levels, interesting. It also raised um, blood pressure, body temperature, hemoglobin A1C and waist circumference were not affected by fasting. Uh, hemo uh, HSCRP went down, which is quite interesting, but what's, Notable is that in this article, which you can see there at the beginning, they reference his case. They show that uric acid went up when he fasted. There are many reports of this, but they also reference multiple other studies that have been done in the past showing that in people who are fasting for Ramadan, et cetera, there is, um, there's really no evidence of gout in people who are fasting. So you can see here as shown in figure 7D, the uric acid level rises during fasting periods and drops down to the normal range after that. A couple other studies that are quite interesting to note here. This one is effects of starvation, high fat diets and ketone infusions on uric acid balance. It's all the things I was saying. Uric acid affects the clearance of, um, excuse me, ketones affect the clearance of uric acid negatively. This study incidentally is from um, uh, 1964 in metabolism. And they show very clearly that fasting, starvation, and ketone infusions increase uric acid, probably because they're decreasing the amount of uric acid clearance. There's also some people who hypothesize that increased apoptosis or apoptosis, depending however you want to say it, is leading to breakdown of cells, cellular house cleaning, and the breakdown of cells could be rele releasing purines, which are metabolized. But in general, this is a study from, uh, also from 1965. There's another one I found from 1925 showing that 
when you look at this ketosis and fasting, the amount of protein breakdown, the nitrogen balance in the blood doesn't go positive. It doesn't look like a whole lot more proteins are actually being broken down, um, which kind of argues against the idea that uric acid is rising because of apoptosis or breakdown. It's probably rising just because the ketones themselves are affecting uric acid excretion at the level of the kidney. I'll go back to the first study and highlight this part of the discussion. We notice the rise of serum uric acid during fasting. This is to be expected during fasting. The body uses other stores of energy, which include the breakdown of stored proteins, amino acids, and fats. They're saying uric acid is a waste product of this catabolic process. Fasting has been reported to increase uric acid in the literature. Here's another report. Guma et al. reported a linear increase in serum uric acid level during the duration of uh, Ramadan fast in 16 volunteers. Runsi and Thompson found the occurrence of hyperuricemia in 42 obese patients treated with total fasting. However, the effect was apparently harmless as none of these patients develop acute gout. So here you have 42, 16, there's, there's over, there's at least 60 people in the, between all of these studies who have increased levels of uric acid. They have what Western medicine would, consume, would consider to be hyperuricemia without gout. So what's going on there? What's the difference? The difference is inflammation. The difference is the fact that metabolic dysfunction is underlying gout. Gout, in my belief, very strongly, is increased uric acid and underlying metabolic dysfunction. Now, why is metabolic dysfunction connected with gout? That is the question we wanna answer. First, I will show you that metabolic dysfunction is very clearly associated with hyperuricemia. There are multiple lines of evidence which support this. Again, they're epidemiology, they're associational, but the association is very strong between metabolic dysfunction, insulin resistance, and gout. So take a look at this one. This is probably the best one I could find, the correlation of serum insulin and the serum uric acid levels with the glycated hemoglobin levels in patients of type 2 diabetes, all three parameters, hemoglobin A1C, serum insulin, serum uric acid were found to be increased in patients of type 2 diabetes as compared to the levels and controls. In the present study, it was concluded that the serum uric acid levels linearly increased with increasing serum insulin levels in newly diagnosed patients. Insulin resistance, metabolic dysfunction clearly correlates with increased uric acid. No question here. One more kind of asking which is the chicken, which is the egg, because it sure looks like um, insulin resistance could be driving high uric acid, although some people believe that high uric acid might be driving insulin resistance. I think that generally it's metabolic dysfunction comes first the majority of the time. What causes metabolic dysfunction? You know the answer to this if you watch my stuff. It's pretty clear this is related to adipocyte hypertrophy. Not hyperplasia, but big fat adipocytes that start leaking free fatty acids and inflammation, the intrusion of macrophages into the adipocytes, and you get an inflammatory milieu going to the liver. Basically, all the signaling from the free fatty acids to the rest of the body is to become insulin resistant. This is pathological insulin resistance. It starts in your adipocytes. I believe it's primarily driven um, by a long-term process which begins with excess polyunsaturated fatty acids. You guys know this. Peter from Hyperlipid is coming on next week. We dig into all of it more. Listen to Brad Marshall. Listen to the podcast with Ben Bickman if you have questions about this. So what we begin to see here is a picture that emerges that starts to really question the prevailing paradigm that uric acid leads to gout, and it's as simple as that. There's clearly a third variable. Just like there's a third variable with LDL, there's a third variable with gout. It's all about context. What is that third variable? That third variable is metabolic dysfunction, which is what's so interesting to me and is involved with essentially everything. Everything is connected with metabolic dysfunction. Now, very interesting work done by a group in a mouse model showing that the um, that ketones can actually be helpful. Now, when do we get uric acid rising? We'll get it during ketosis, but here, look, beta hydroxybutyrate deactivates the NLRP3 inflammasome to relieve gout flares. So here we have a ketogenic model Granted, it's in mice, but this is actually connecting increased levels of ketones with <clears throat> decreased inflammation and relieving gout flares in a mouse model. Why would that be if uric acid is going up in ketogenesis, right? If it were as simple as uric acid leads to gout, ketogenesis should worsen gout. But in most people, it improves it 
because they are improving their insulin sensitivity by eliminating carbohydrates in the short term, which are stoking the fire that was started by, in my opinion, excess linoleic acid, excess polyunsaturated fatty acids. Now, I want to wrap this one up with the discussion of the NLRP3 inflammasome, its connections with the neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio. Before I do that, I want to talk about one thing, which is that many people will say that fructose worsens gout. And I think that in the setting of massive amounts of fructose, it could. But I am not convinced that absent metabolic dysfunction, fructose is going to worsen gout. When that blood work that you saw from me was done, you all know I was eating 100 plus grams of carbohydrates as honey. I'm eating a moderate amount of fructose. I'm not having excess uric acid. There's something else going on. Now, massive amounts of fructose in high fructose corn syrup, all these other things could definitely be an issue here. Now, if you're pouring it down the fructose pathway, fructolysis looks very different than glycolysis. There's no check because phosphofructokinase isn't there. But in general, fructose, I don't think immediately leads to gout the way that everybody says it does without metabolic dysfunction. I'll show a couple of pathways here that illustrate this. So alcohol intake probably does because alcohol specifically leads to increased uh, uric acid retention in the body. And alcohol is not a good thing when it comes to insulin sensitivity or when it comes to overall metabolic health. Purine intake leads to purine degradation. Uh, we know this is xanthine oxidase, hypoxanthine, xanthine, uric acid, as we talked about before. Many will point to this side, the fructose side, and you know fructose does come in here. There's really no check on how much goes to triglyceride accumulation, which is why we shouldn't be eating massive amounts of fructose, but normal evolutionary amounts don't, I think, cause major issues. The main pathway I've seen people say is that, oh, this fructose is going to lead to more AMP, more inosine monophosphate, more inosine, and that leads to more uric acid this way. But I, as you can see, in my case, in Kurt's case, without underlying metabolic dysfunction, this does not necessarily happen. There's something else going on. Moderate amounts of fructose, I do not believe, are harmful in any way, shape, or form when it comes to gout, provided that you are metabolically healthy. That's what you guys get when I get super excited about all this stuff. I just start singing. <laughs> These are important to know the difference between fructolysis, fructolysis, and glycolysis. Glycolysis goes through these steps. Phosphofructokinase here is the rate limiting step. Fructose is gonna bypass that and can go through these steps here and go to acetyl-CoA without any impediment, which means you can accumulate triglycerides and VLDLs if you have tons of fructose, but moderate amounts of fructose that we would have found seasonally in the environment, I don't think are a problem for humans. And we've seen that in the Hadza. We've seen that in tons of cultures who include fructose in their diet, but don't have gout. One of the coolest things that I came across in my research for this was this book, Western Diseases, Their Emergence and Prevention. Incidentally, Dennis Burkett, the guy that came up with the idea that fiber prevents constipation or prevents diverticulosis is one of the authors, but nevertheless, they study a number of cultures in the book. And you can see, this is kind of like Western Price all over. You can see the emergence of diseases in a number of hunter-gatherer populations, Inuit, North American Indians, uh, Mare Indians of Brazil, Australian Aborigines, Papua New Guinea, et cetera, what they find over and over, just like what Weston Price found, was that indigenous cultures do not suffer from these diseases of civilization. These cultures are eating honey. Honey is eaten across the world where it is available. They don't see gout in the Hadza. And the Hadza are the perfect, uh, the perfect test tube, the perfect Petri dish, quote unquote, for gout, if you believe the mainstream hypothesis, if you believe the mainstream paradigm, they're eating meat and organs and honey, but they don't have gout. We know this from anthropologic examinations. What's going on? It's something underlying, which is metabolic dysfunction. And how is metabolic dysfunction connected? This is where things got really interesting for me. If you remember the podcast I did with Tommy Wood, we talked about the neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio, specifically immunometabolism, and how the neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio becomes disordered when you are metabolically broken. How does gout actually happen? You have to have this immunologic response to the uric acid. There's a spark. And I think that spark is coming from the immune system. And my hypothesis, my belief, which I would hypothesize, is that in people who have metabolic dysfunction, there is dysregulation of the immune system. There's more neutrophils to lymphocytes. You see an abnormal neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio. And that is the ultimate imbalancing arbiter at the immunologic level 
that allows excess uric acid to become problematic in humans because you cannot resolve the inflammation. Here's a really cool paper, relationship between neutrophil lymphocyte ratio and insulin resistance in newly diagnosed type 2 diabetes patients. I had this in the paper. There's a whole podcast with Tommy Wood on this, the Immunometabolism podcast from a few uh, months ago. The neutrophil lymphocyte ratios of diabetic patients were significantly higher than those of healthy controls. What does this lead to? This leads to activation of the NLRP3 inflammasome, and that is at the center of gout. The NLRP3 inflammasome role in metabolic disorders and regulation by metabolic pathways. What pathway did we see beta hydroxybutyrate improving? What pathway do we see worsening when people are metabolically broken? NLRP3 inflammasome. This is the spark to the uric acid. This is how metabolic dysfunction connects immunologically with increased levels of uric acid in those with gout. So I looked for a connection here. Lo and behold, monocyte to lymphocyte ratio, neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio, RDW are the associates with gouty arthritis. Imagine that, you guys. A disorder neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio associates with gouty arthritis because metabolic dysfunction is driving this, not purely uric acid in and of itself. And as we've seen, getting more uric acid in your diet, or at least getting more purines, doesn't lead to more uric acids. How do you get gout? You eat things that create uric acid while you have metabolic dysfunction. If you eat things that create uric acid and you don't have metabolic dysfunction, what happens? You thrive. Nothing happens. The Hadza, me, Kurt, people on carnivore, carnivore-ish diets. Fructose doesn't cause this unless it's in massive excess, but linoleic acid just might be. Hydroxyoctadecandienoic acids, these are the HODES, Oxlams, novel regulators of macrophage differentiation and atherogenesis now. The hypothesis here would be that excess oxidative products of linoleic acid metabolism are contributing to some of the innate immune system activation, which leads to disordered immune response to underlying normal physiology, like uric acid levels when we eat purines. So if you want to avoid gout, be metabolically healthy be metabolically healthy. You don't have to avoid meat and organs. Those are the most nutritious foods. And if you need more meat and organs, you can always check us out at Hard and Soil, hardandsoil.co. Love you guys. This was a fun one to make. I love how it connected a lot of dots. It was really interesting for me. If you know someone with gout, please share this. You can always email me, Dr. Paul, drpaul, hardandsoil.co if you have questions. We're so grateful that you guys find the products we make beneficial and we're happy to do this work. It's an honor. Love you guys. You are part of the remembering.